was the, of course, rainbow theme tune. Oh yes, generations after generations will remember that as the soundtrack to their childhood. And today I'm joined by none other than a real national treasure who has been performing on stage and screen for more than 50 years. 50 years, can you believe that? From working with Jim Henson and the Muppets to, of course, the iconic Muffin the Mule. And he's even had his hand stuck up a dog's behind. And, of course, that wasn't intended to be as rude as it sounded, but I mean sausage brain sweep, of course, in the Sooty Show. But, of course, he'll be fondly remembered for portraying the naughty chappy Zippy in Rainbow, of course. Be my guest, Ronnie Lee Drew. Hello, thank you for a very nice introduction. Lovely to be joining you. Oh, well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Um, So, we're going to start back from the very beginning with you, as people might be surprised to learn that you weren't actually born over here. You were born in Toronto. And I was quite surprised to learn that it took you (laughs) about four months nearly to get over here to England. That's right, yes. Well, basically, um, I had about two and a half years in Toronto, which was lovely. I mean, I don't remember very much of it, being so young, but my father had decided that he would like to get a better degree, because he was studying to be a science teacher at the time, and in England, the degrees were thought much a higher standard. So, he took my mum and my sister and I and um, we sold up our house in Toronto and um, travelled on a boat to Southampton in England uh, where we stayed with some relatives for a very short time. Then we stayed with some, I think another aunt in Poole in Dorset and then went on to to a flat which um, we stayed in in South London, Stockwell, South London where I stayed um, with my mum, dad and sister for, well, I was about 16 when I left home for the first time. So, and that's the beginnings. But um, my interest in puppetry, of course, started while I was living there. And that was really, so I suppose it started with getting a, a few of Pelham puppets. They were puppets you could buy in London stores and very popular with lots of children. And they were marionette string puppets. And I had three of them. They were, we, we weren't a terribly rich family, so we couldn't afford very many. But I did have three. And um, I thought that was enough to do a show because I thought puppets, you know, are very nice to have sort of hanging around, but it's much better to have to play with them. So um, basically, um, during the summer holidays, I would set up an upright, uh, sorry, uh, yes, an upright table um, in the, the sort of, um, stairway or stairwell that was the, the, the center. I was, we lived on the first floor. So the second floor, there was a staircase going up to the second floor. And that made a perfect um, auditorium, or I, I was going to say raked auditorium for the children to sit. And we had, I had these puppets, I think as far as I remember, there was a, um, a poodle and a bulldog. And I think we had a girl dancer called Mitzi. And they were, you know, fairly basic characters. But somehow, with those three puppets, and I probably had other puppets as well, but I can't really remember them. And we had a wind-up gramophone. And we had some music that was played through that. And we did very unsophisticated shows. When I say we, it would be my sister and I. And... Um, but believe it or not, the children loved watching them and they would ask us, when are you doing your next puppet show? Anyway, one of the things that did happen was that I um, saved up my pocket money and um, I bought myself a Pollux toy theatre. And that's a little model theatre, which was, very, they were very popular um, in the sort of First World War period. Uh, people would, families would buy these um Pollock's theatres, and they would buy um, penny plane sheets and tuppence coloured sheets, and these were the characters of their favourite plays that they would have seen in the theatre, and you'd cut them out, or stick them onto cardboard first. If you got the penny plane ones, you'd have to colour in the, the various costumes on the on the little uh, characters, and you'd colour in the scenery as well. It was 
lit, little model theatre where the, the cur you could lift up the curtain, the front curtain, and you could watch a performance. This time I moved in from the, um, the stairs going up to the second floor into my bedroom, which wasn't very big, so I'd have to have an audience of about four people at the time, and I set up these, um, this model theatre, and I remember the, the play that I loved doing <laughs> was, can you believe, Hamlet? There was a little script with the with the book of um, characters and scenes, and I thought the audience was absolutely wonderful. They were so quiet, and they seemed to be really enjoying what I was performing. Anyway, I did an, the next scene, and I put the curtain down. And I thought I'm going to go out and say thank you very much. You're absolutely brilliant. And I went round. I was I was completely hidden from them. You see, so I didn't couldn't see them until I went out from behind the stage there. And I came out. And believe it or not, all four of them had crept away very quietly and left the bedroom and probably gone outside to play because they were bored out of their mind because I was having a wonderful time, but not really entertaining them, but entertaining myself. And it was a very early lesson about puppetry or performing anyway. You don't just perform for yourself, you're performing to an audience. Um, I. Would you like me to carry on? I can carry on. I hope I'm not um, talking too much. No, I wanted to, of course, it's fascinating, but I, I, you mentioned previously about your parents not sort of taking a, an interest in the arts as such. So where really was your inspiration? Where did it come from, this love of puppetry? Well, I think probably, that's a good question, I think probably... Um, through watching variety programs on television, I did. I was able to stay up when I was quite young to watch Sunday night at the London Palladium, and they used to have these wonderful Tiller girls dancing. It, and it was the Palladium is the wonderful theatre in London where they, you know you have marvellous variety shows and nowadays pantomimes. And um, that was the program hosted by Bruce Forsyth. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and when I was a kid, I'd watch this show, and I thought, gosh, this is something I'd love to do. I'd and I wanted to do entertaining, and I think that gave me a sort of interest in performing. Um, the other interest, I suppose, uh, about using puppets was that there used to be a program on BBC called Watch With Mother, and that was usually in the afternoons, I think, as far as I remember, and there were programs like... Bill and Ben, the flower pot men, oh, no. and there was Andy Pandy, there was Picture Page, oh, there were several other programs, yes. and they were, I think, would be, if you watch them nowadays, they're a little bit old-fashioned and probably a little bit sort of um, middle class, rather nice, you know, people had lovely voices in those days, but anyway... Um, um, so I'm talking about uh, Watch With Mother, which, of course, was a little bit before my time. But I, I still have very, very fond memories of uh, Watch With Mother because my mother and my auntie would introduce me to those programmes, which was lovely. Uh, and I remember a, a segment on a videotape I had, which was called Watch With Mother, uh, there was a lovely young lady on there who spoke very posh, as you, as you said, <laughs> and she had a little sausage dog. And, oh, right. and she made a little lantern out of paper and it was so beautifully and so simple the way that she did it uh, it was very easy for people to to copy she demonstrated it very well um, but I think personally that we underestimate uh, children now and I know that you say it's a little bit outdated but I still think that simplicity um, of children's television is very much there today Mm, mm. Children are very engaged still. In oh, definitely. And, you know, all children like to paint, all children like to make things. They want to copy, don't they? I mean, that's how they learn. And I think that program probably was Picture Page, which, as far as I can remember, was, was this delightful presenter. And I remember the, the Lantern show. I, you know, they were lovely, made out of paper. And, you, and it, was, it was very simple, but it, they were really effective. And there was lots of things in that particular program where you could make things or you could collect things. That was another thing. I remember um, 
she had a whole pile of different shells that she'd been to the seaside and she'd collected these shells and they were sort of razor shells, the long thin ones, and then there'd be round ones. And, and it, it was obviously it wasn't colour television, so we didn't see the colour. Right. But somehow we we saw all these different things and it gave us an interest in perhaps collecting things and finding things and talking about them to our parents and to our friends. It started off a whole dialogue without um, it being too um, too complicated for you know a preschool child yes. uh, but it was it was really fascinating and I, I think there are things occasionally that you you see today that are on television that you know are, are good in that respect I think the program another program I watched funny enough even when I was a kid was Blue Peter and that was a BBC program and there was lots of things there and all through the decades they've had always had making things um, I always remember them making Trace, Tracy Island which was a the island for, um, for the the thund where the Thunderbirds um, family lived, the Traces, the, all the brothers and the father. And that, that was a particular favourite of mine, obviously, because I was slightly older and yes. would watched, watched Thunderbirds and all these wonderful I Jerry Anderson that. puppet series. Yes, guess you're late, later down the line, your sort of childhood sort of come true with the Thunderbirds because you were a part of one of the adverts for them. Indeed, yes. I mean, that this is now coming up to my, my professional career. Yes, a few years ago, I was asked if I'd be interested in um, being involved in a commercial with the character Brains, who was the, the, well, the brains of the Tracy family in a way. He was the one who had all the ideas and invented a lot of amazing things for the Thunderbirds team, who basically were a family who went to save people from terrible disasters. And things like that. Anyway, the Brains character was um, a wonderful character. I, difficult to describe him on the phone, but he had these lovely blue glasses, and he, he looked very, um, uh, what did I say, very brainy. as a terrible pun. But anyway, he he, um, he was asked in this commercial. He was he used to drink um, drench water, and that was what the the commercial was all about this wonderful bottled water called Drench. Yes. And after drinking this, he left his chair and danced the most amazing dance. And that refreshed him. And he was, it really gave him, um, made him into a brilliant dancer or something. Anyway, that was the idea of the commercial. And, and it took myself and about five other puppeteers to work this puppet in, in an, um, well, hopefully in a really interesting and um, fascinating way that made people think, oh, we must buy Drench, but wasn't that puppy yes. good? And <laughs> um, well, that's, slightly, that's what I worked on. Are you slightly frustrated that, um, because recently we've seen Th Thunderbirds return, but it hasn't returned in its original form using the puppets, it's now with animation. Do you look back and think, I wish they had still used those wonderful puppets? Yes, I mean, I, I do. I mean, I, as you say, I was my, my, my childhood and my, my, my favourites were certainly the use of the puppets and the different characters. Um, it, I think there, there was a trend a few years ago that, that everything now has to be animated, either with a computer animation or um, sort of um, 3D sort of animation, whatever they call it. But it. Um, to me, it's lost the soul of what of the characters. They don't have that sort of. Um, they're almost too perfect. Let's put it that way. They move. They everything all happens. Quite interesting to watch, but there's no soul to the program. Whereas the old puppet shows, you 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 had the, there might be things that go slightly wrong, or you might see a string. If I mean, it didn't never matter to me seeing the strings, but. You, you somehow believed in those characters more strongly. I think watching a 3D um, figure moving about um, is, was much more satisfying. Um, but again, you know, I don't know what this generation would think, probably because they haven't seen that many, um, certainly marionette shows, they might not really know the difference between. So hence, they are, I suppose they are popular. But yes, um, to answer your question, yes, I am. I am. I much prefer to see the puppets doing the actions rather than the cartoon. Yes. Um, one of the um, 
because apart from Watch With Mother and all of the programmes that my mother showed me, uh, back <coughs> in my generation, which was the 90s, the first sort of puppet on strings, marionette puppet, that I was compelled watching was a character called Lizzie. And she was in a children's television programme called Play Dates. Ah, oh, yes. Bus. And she had this black curly hair and she would be on these marionette strings and she would sing these songs and dance about... And it was just the most compelling thing, because although it's very simple, and as a child, I remember sitting there thinking, well, she's on strings, that's a bit strange. You don't, you don't think as a, uh, logically as a child, and it was just the most compelling thing that I, I remember watching. And I wish that, especially in my generation and now, that there were more of those simplistic <clears throat> programs on television. But um, It's interesting you mention that program because in fact I was involved in that very program um, <laughs> it, um, the, the puppeteer who um, operated Lizzie the marionette was um, a puppeteer called Jane Tyson Eve Jane Eve and she worked with John Wright who was the founder director of the Little Angel Theatre um, that I joined as a young teenager or well, 15 year old um, to learn, you know, professional puppetry. But um, getting back to, to Lizzie, um, Jane was one of already um, a puppeteer with John Wright, and um, she was asked him, I think her, her husband, her late husband, was a designer and worked a lot for the BBC. And um, I don't know whether he designed any of the play school things or play days, Things, but he certainly was in contact with um, the, the various programs that were on at Television Centre or whatever. In fact, it was made away from Television Centre, actually. But anyway, it was still a BBC program. Um, and she asked John if she could borrow Lizzie, this puppet, um, that John had carved for a, a show, um, a, a musical show, that we, we put on a few years before. And she um, basically, um, he said yes, and she became, I think it was on a Tuesday, I think she was on the play bus stop, and um, it was, it was the, the, it was it Lizzie's stop? I can't remember how they used to do it. But when Jane couldn't do the programs, um, sometimes she was busy, she'd ring me up and say, Ronnie, would you be interested in working the puppet? And so I worked the puppet a few times um, during um, the Play Day series. And um, so I had the opportunity of working the puppet too. The very interesting thing with Jane was that she was also an absolutely brilliant carver of puppets. So if they wanted a change of costume or a ch different shoes that she might wear, Jane could carve the shoes and, you know, they looked absolutely brilliant. But she was also a really clever puppeteer and she'd worked as well as um, with John Wright. She worked with the Salzburg marionettes in Austria, and they were very famous, well they still are, a famous troupe of, um, um, a marionette troupe, I should say, and the company um, performed Mozart operas, So, and they were very, very subtle movements and beautiful productions, and so, you know, she'd had a, a really, um, a wealth of experience working marionettes, and also making them too. So, um, yes, play days. Gosh, that was a nice memory that you, you jogged my mind there. And it's funny that I should have a part of it. Of course, I had no idea that you were a part of play days. And again, that was a show that proved to have longevity. That style of programme, which I guess uh, originated from uh, the likes of Play School and all of that sort of... That's right. ...for children. So, but um, I want to go back uh, slightly um, to uh, a young Ronald. Uh, as well. um, uh, I was quite fascinated to um, read that one of the very first puppet shows you went to see was The Little Mermaid. Ah, yes. And that was the show that I, I guess when you was watching, you know, you thought this is what I really want to do. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, this was my first visit. While I was at the Puppet Guild, um, there was a, um, I, I, I'd heard already that there was a puppet theatre in existence, but from, fun enough, from Bob Pelham, who was the man who, you know, who made all the, or with his team of um, helpers and workers, the Pelham puppets. And 
and um, he I sent a letter to him saying, look, I, you know, is there a place I can learn to do puppetry? Is there a theatre of puppets? I had no idea. And he wrote back to me, and I still have the letter in my scrapbook, saying, yes, there is, why don't you talk to John Wright at the Little Angel Theatre in North London? And that's what I did. But I went with a friend who was an Australian puppeteer who was visiting at the time, and we went along to the theatre together. She knew John Wright, and she was going to introduce me, which I thought was a great, you know, great way to um, to meet the man. Because I was, obviously, I was quite young. I was probably, at that age, I was probably... 14 or something like that. Anyway, um, that was, I, I arrived there at the theatre with Mrs. Murray, the Australian puppeteer I talked about, and the show started, the curtain, the house lights went down, the curtain went up, and there was this beautiful picture of the mermaid, the little mermaid, with her, he her head and her cheek against the cheek of a, of a, um, a figurehead, which was sort of had been an old uh, figurehead of, on a, a lovely sailing ship or something, and that had obviously been a sea, you know, been wrecked in a storm or something, and there it was under the water, and we had this lovely green and bluey lights, we had a gauze down, and you just, you had this lovely Janacek music, and the mermaid swam round the figurehead rock, and, um, and put her cheek against it, and it was, that was the most stunning, beautiful looking thing, and then the gauze went up, and then um, she swam round again, and then suddenly there was a few flashes from the light, and it was above, uh, the, on the top of the water, there was um, a big um, storm going on, and all of a sudden, um, bits of the ship were cut, came down right at the very back, and it was just broken bits, so you'll realize that a ship had been struck by lightning and was sinking, and was coming down into the water and then last of all was this prince which uh, you know this this who floated down in the water and landed almost at her feet at the bottom of the sea there and she went over to him and said oh my goodness i remember i men can't live underwater i must take him to the surface so she and of course it's perfect with string puppets she pushed against him and, and with her, her own weight she and her tail was wagging like mad and she lifted him up and he and she put him up and he, he arrived on the or she put him onto a rock on the surface. And that was the first scene. I've never forgotten it. It was the most beautiful thing. And um after that, after seeing that show, um, I decided there and then that um, puppetry was for me. I've got to somehow get involved in this puppet theatre. They seem really nice people. And um, I, I asked John at the time, and he said, well, um, we can um, take you on. We do have apprentices here, but um, we, we won't be able to afford to pay you anything. Um, it'll have to be that you come for what we call services rent to the theatre, so you'll help backstage and sweep up okay. stuff and generally sort of do all the, you know, um, clearing up and put bags over mm -hmm. the puppets to stop the dust getting to them and things like that. Well, I didn't mind about that at all. I thought the fact that he thought it, I could join them would, mm -hmm. was fantastic. So I went back and thanked Mrs. Murray and went back home and I said to my parents, look, mum, I know I was going to stay on at school and do some exams, but I just discovered that John Wright has apprentices and I would love to join theatre and uh, so my, my mother and father went into the kitchen I remember at the time and they probably stayed in the kitchen for about a minute or a minute and a half to decide what my future would be well I thought it was well it felt like it was you know hours they were in there anyway they came out and my mother had a twinkle in her eye and said look actually we've talked we've discussed this Ronnie and we, we feel that we can give you six months um, yes you can leave school even though I think my father was a little bit worried about leaving school without any exams even at that all those years ago but anyway um, and um, I remember those saying to John um, to my father oh um my father said to me first, actually asked me questions, well, how much will they be paying you, by the way? And I said, oh, they won't be paying me. It'll all be for services rendered at the theatre. Well, of course, that was a bit um, worrying for my father. But as I say, they discussed all that in the kitchen, came back and said, OK, we'll give you six months, three months for you to see whether you really enjoy being at the theatre and three months for the theatre company to make sure that they, they're happy to have you there. Because after that, you know, if, if you didn't fit into their company, then, you know, it would be useless. We'd, you'd have to go back to school. And I, I 
adored being there and as I say I still enjoy doing performances when I can there sadly with Covid we're not able to do performance of the theatres you know closed but they do lots of online things now so um, you can always contact the Little Angel Theatre it's a very easy website it's www.littleangeltheatre.com and you can find out what they're up to okay, we'll definitely put a link to that uh, theatre um, on your screen um, yeah so that is sadly the way forward at the moment with uh, the Covid situation but um, it's amazing your parents must have seen that passion you had for theatre to say, well, actually, we'll allow you to take time out of school to see whether you would like to pursue this career. Absolutely. They were really kind. Uh, I think probably I'm going to be horrible in a way, but I think my mother was uh, had seen it right from the early on, you know, early on in my sort of life I think she knew that I wasn't a sort of a sports person I didn't go around kicking footballs I wasn't all that keen on watching football or doing all that sort of stuff on television or even you know doing all that but I loved watching the Sunday afternoon um, matinees that used to be on you know the Ginger Rogers Fred Astaire movies all the old musicals she loved all that you see she'd love watching those um, and so I think with that she always remembered that that was sort of I had a passion for that sort of stuff so um, it, it was it was really convincing my dad and I think it was very sweet of him really because I think he did you know he was worried um, you know being in the teaching profession anyway it must have been quite hard for him to decide and I think my mother probably said to him and in that that meeting that initial meeting in the kitchen that um, please you know Les my father's name was Leslie you know please Les you know I'm sure he'll prove us right he will do something because you know he's always had a passion for theatre mm -hmm. and should we could just give him this chance and um, he agreed which was lovely but it, as I say it must have been a really hard decision for him because I think he'd lo loved me to have stayed on and taken some exams but sadly I probably even if I had stayed on I, I academically I wasn't really brilliant I wasn't really enjoying senior school anyway mm -hmm. so um, it was you know absolutely wonderful that I was able to um, you know um, take on a profession or take on a job that in, ended up being the mm -hmm. job of my life so well, there you go I can understand your dad being quite reserved in some respects because um, I guess at the time he was thinking well you know in this world now that you call show business it can be up and down you know it's not a one straight road where it's all success so um i think it was a brave decision for him on his part to say well actually you know we're gonna allow you to do this but of course i guess you then had your education to fall back on if anything did um go wrong but uh thankfully for you it didn't because the only way for you was up <laughs> that's very kind of you I, m I must admit I think having that start at the Little Angel Theatre the only building for puppets at the time and so all sort of puppeteer that maybe needed an assistant or something like that would eventually turn up at the Little Angel Theatre so I did meet a lot of different puppeteers while I was training there um, so, I'm sorry I was going to come on to uh, in a moment about the first um, marionette puppet that you uh, had on stage professionally but um, you mentioned at the um, where were we you were mentioned at the uh, theater the little theater um, mm. the little angel theater that yeah. um, you were doing sort of ushering and that sort of thing that's right and one of the things that I found very endearing and sweet is that during the intervals and when shows weren't happening you were able to go up into the box and sort of have a little play with the marionettes absolutely which must have been a joy for you oh it was I'm, I was very very lucky um, yes during the time during the week we didn't always have we had performances mostly at weekends and then during school holidays we had shows during the week and then the theatre was sort of more or less um, it wasn't closed for performances but if, if somebody booked the theatre to do shows we would obviously do shows for them but there were, there were times when there wasn't performances on 
and um, they would be constructing new shows because obviously, you know, you you, you can only do a performance say of the Little Mermaid for I don't know about for a month, and after that you'd have to have another show. And so these were new shows are being made and carved and and designed and all the rest of them rehearsed. So um, it was very exciting. But during that time too, uh, certainly in the lunch hours, I'd have a quick lunch and I'd come whizzing back and go up on what we call the bridge, which is, it's literally what it means, a bridge across the stage. And that's where um, the puppets were hanging above there and you'd unhook them from their hooks and you could work the puppet and the strings were quite long and um, you could, you one learned how to walk and uh, act with the puppet. And um, that was really very exciting. And then eventually I got um, small parts in the shows. I mean, my first job was to move the scenery about and generally um, do the scene changes. I, obviously, you know, it takes a, it took a while, a few months to, to be able to feel confident in making the puppet walk, let alone sort of act. And, and there was all oh, lots. It's a bit like, I suppose, learning to be an actor. You're these. They were mostly human characters. There were some animal characters and some abstract characters as well. But um, the, the most of the plays were sort of fairy tales, like The Little Mermaid, The Rapunzel, um, or various various other stories. But they, you, you would. You'd learn movement, so you wouldn't, what we call, um, move the puppets too frantically, or else people wouldn't be able to see them clearly. You, you, you just took a pose and let the words say the words, and then you'd change another pose, and, mm. uh, and then you'd go on to another way. And then if, if, for instance, they were sad, you could tilt the control and the heads would go forward, and you could walk very slowly and heavily, and that would show the emotion, even though they didn't have moving mouths or moving eyes or anything like that, um, just by watching the puppet's movement and hearing the voice and the way the voice was um, acted, you get a real, uh, you certainly get an idea of whether the puppet was happy or sad or or, mm. or thinking, you know, in, in a sort of um, thinking, what would we do, you know, what would I do in this situation, oh, and mm. perhaps tapping its finger against its chin or something like this and they became really realistic and people really enjoyed watching it's so beautiful to hear you reminisce because i can see in how you come across when you speak the passion that you still have for the work that you do um i think is beautiful and uh uh, I believe that, you know, back then you were getting paid something like £10 a week. to do. Something. Oh, absolutely. Then, yes. That's a lot of money, wasn't it? Well, it was a little bit more money then than it is nowadays. But um, I did, I used to be, I, I'm going to be tell you, I was a bit wicked. I used to, I was still living at home when I first worked at Little Angel. And I used to um, say, I got onto the tube at Stockwell and got, got off at the Angel tube station. It was all on the Northern Line. But in those days, I'm afraid I did only pay. I used to say, one from Old Street, please, which was the stop before the Angel. So I didn't have to pay the full fare. I was a bit naughty. And then I could only afford the, um, the cheapest dinners at the cafe in Cross Street, where we always used to go and have lunch, you know, sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it taught me um, how to live fairly fr frugally, really. Um, and so, and I didn't buy lots of things. I was just happy that I, well, I didn't have the money to buy, but I was happy just to be part of the company. And, and I just soaked in all the, all the stuff I could learn, really. It was, I was a bit like a, a sponge. I just sort of soaked in all this knowledge. And um, it's been fantastic for me because I'm, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm, what's nice is I'm actually giving it back now as a teacher. You know, I teach marionetting, I teach oh. puppetry. And so it's quite nice to be able to give back what one has learned. Mm -hmm. You know, you're continuing the next generation of puppeteers. Well, I think it's amazing there's still that interest out there for um, uh, people who want to learn uh, marionette and how to use the strings. I think that's in incredible, of course. Um, so let's move on um, slightly. We've got to move on to, uh, of course, what people have been waiting for. Uh, because, uh, as much as I've loved, I've, I've really, really... I really loved talking to you about uh, all the other things that you've done. Mm. Um, I've, I've loved it. I, when I first came into this, I thought, well, I'm going to really enjoy talking about Rainbow, but actually I've loved all the nostalgia 
that you've spoken <coughs> about so passionately. Um, was it as simple as this that um, when you were offered the job on Rainbow, you <coughs> you'd ex you um, explained to them that you'd worked on Muffin the Mule, and they said, "Well, actually, that's our childhood. You've got the job." Thing else, but do you sort of have Muffin the Mule to thank for that? That's right. What, what happened with Muffin was I did all these shows in the parks with Jan and Ann Bustle, and then um, after a few years, they did, you know, they, they passed away. And um, there was a, um, in about, I'm trying to remember when it was, I think it would be in the 80s or maybe the 90s. I can't really remember that. I'm very bad at remembering the years. But um, the grandchildren um, were. Well, 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 in fact, the grandson, William, he was with his mother, in fact, because um, Jan and Anne had a daughter, Sally. Sadly, she died very young. But anyway, she um, was having an animated cartoon of Muffin um, made, and um, she, the BBC decided to put it on, and they asked me if I would go along to the television studios, this is at White City, when the BBC were there in London, um, to work the Muffin puppet, because they knew that I could um, work the puppet and would make it look good or whatever. And I met them, I hadn't met the, the family for a very long time up until then, but it was really nice to, to renew friendships. And um, the cartoon series did go on for, a, for about, I think they did one series of it. Um, but then um, there was a company that um, took over the sort of publicity and stuff, and they made muffin, little muffin books and things. They made some toys and stuff like that. But again, like these things, it didn't quite take off like it did in the 50s. And so it didn't, um, it didn't sort of become terribly popular. But what I have done, um, the, um, there's a, a, a great nostalgia for puppetry that was on during the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and 80s. And um, because my period was sort of late, well, middle 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that was my sort of formative period, I was able to um, work work Muffin. And I what I did was um, I performed Muffin, I think, for the 70th birthday of the BBC, which they started their transmissions at Alexandra Palace, which isn't actually all that far away from where I live now. And um, I was able to work Muffin. I asked if I could borrow Muffin for that occasion. And um, that was a great, you know, really lovely, lovely time. I actually visited the place where they'd started you know, John Logie Baird, the sort of, and his system of television, and then there was the EMI system, which is more electrical. John Logie Baird was a Scottish gentleman who invented the sort of television pictures way back in 1936. Um, anyway, I went back there and I did Muffin there, and that was lovely. And I'm going back again, fun enough, I think in August this year, they've got, um, there's a, a, a Facebook community called, Col I think they a group called Kaleidoscope, and they're people that love old nostalgic um, um, films and television and old adverts, and these uh, they and they collect stuff that is believed to be lost and stuff like that. And so, anyway, um, they're having a meeting at Ale Alexander Palace, and they're going to open up the old two remaining um, studios at. Um, the um, Alexander Palace, and they were going to do a tour, and they've asked if I could bring Muffin along. But um, yes, no, Muffin is still is still there, um, uh, less less out 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 the front as it were mm -hmm. nowadays. But um, as I say, he does make appearances, odd appearances, and it's really nice to work him. And um, as I say, I'm still very friendly with the the grandchildren and their families, which is really nice. Good. Well, um, Ronnie, I need to sign up to that Facebook group. <laughs> I really ah. Yes, um, I think I'll be one of the top members um, for that group. Um, <laughs> yes, no, I love everything uh, like that. So I'll have to go. I'm really intrigued because um, I don't really remember Muffin the Mule as vividly. I know that my parents will, but I'm very intrigued tonight to go home and just watch Muffin the Mule. Well, there, I can t let tell you that if you go onto YouTube and type in Muffin the Mule, there are some, um, I mean, they would be in black and white, but 
but there's some old um, programs that they've put on YouTube and you can see them. And what's interesting is that um, the lady that played the piano um, was a lady called Annette Mills. And she was the older sister of John Mills, the famous Mills family oh, theatre yeah. of actors. And so you may well remember Haley Mills and Juliet Mills. They were John Mills' daughters. Mm -hmm. And um, they were famous. They made lots of films and they're still around. And do I don't know whether they... I think they do still. I think both of them still act now. Mm -hmm. They're in their early 70s now, I think. But even so, um, that was, she was very famous, Annette Mills, for being the presenter of the program. She played the piano and Muffin danced on the, ta on the grand piano mm -hmm top of the piano. They didn't lift the lid of the piano, they left it sort of flat so he could dance uh, with his friends as well. I will I will do that. I will watch with interest and I will see mm. really Drew is holding that beautiful puppet. Um, <laughs> yes, so you mentioned uh, we're going to 1972, wasn't it 1973, mm -hmm. when you first joined Rainbow. When did Rainbow yep. first air on television? Rainbow first aired in, 19, I think it was in October 1972. I haven't got the date right in front of me, I'm afraid. But I started in 1973. So we have Muffin the Mule to thank for that. And we I think saying that I'd worked Muffin the Mule got me the job, yes. I was talking to the producer, the then producer of the program. She was, in fact, the original producer. She started the whole program way back in 1972. And um, I... I visited her as a friend had said, you know, you must go and meet the producer and, and I'm sure, you know, you'll be right for taking over doing the puppet of Zippy. So anyway, I saw her over lunch and I told her that you know, about all the sort of different things I'd done. And she said, oh, yes, that's very interesting. And then I thought, oh, gosh, I don't think she's terribly impressed. But then I said, well, I did work um, one of the first television um, iconic puppet characters, Martin the Mule. And she, her eyes lit up. And I think she was of the age where she would have watched Martin on television, you see. So she went, oh, how fascinating, how marvellous. And so, <laughs> so and um, from, I think, 1973, if I remember rightly, I started doing the puppet of Zippy um, and continued right up until way 1996 or something so sort of 20 years of doing working zippy the puppet on on the thames television series rainbow till 92 and then some other series which we did rainbow days was one of them and then we went back to just the name rainbow for the last few series we did mm -hmm. um and they were sort of in, made by an independent company right okay yeah okay so you joined very much after in the we, early days, I suppose. Days, yeah. yeah. Because a lot of people, um, you know, who watch Rainbow and remember Rainbow will remember Jeffrey. But oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Of course, Jeffrey wasn't the original presenter of Rainbow. No, the original presenter was a man called David Cook. And, and also, Bungle Bear was um, um, an actor called John Leeson who um, is, was K-9 on Doctor Who, the little oh, the dog. Yes, yes. And he also, he's been, he's an, a, a jobbing actor now. And um, so he probably appears on other stuff, which I'm afraid I haven't right. seen lately. But um, he's very much with us. And um, and um, he, he, he was the original Bungle. And David Cook, eventually, when he left Rainbow, became a novelist, actually, oh. and a writer. But... Sadly, he died a few years ago, so he's not okay. with us any longer. And um, I remember, um, uh, if I can recall correctly, that the original Bungle looked terribly scary. Yes, he was quite horrific looking. He had quite starey eyes. I don't know why he was made like that. It's very interesting. Um, if you hear John Leeson talking about it, he used to say that he... he um, he did wonder there was some reaction for some people you know they either it was a bit like marmite they you either they either children either loved it or hated it and um, probably there was more people that hated the look of bungle then than um than the, the new look bungle which came when stanley bates took over bungle which wasn't all that long after it started i think it would be in 73 again that sort of time so 
luckily, the old bungle didn't last for too long, although I think there was about two series of um, Rainbow okay. with the old bungle and, um, um, and David Cook being the presenter. I seem to remember... Uh, in the very, very early days with David Cook, that Bungle had a very high-pitched voice. Yes, he did indeed. It sort of didn't perhaps match the um, sort of warmth that Bungle gives off now, really. No, so it was very that's right. I think Stanley, when he took over, they had a slightly different um, Bungle skin, do I dare say, it made. And it was a slightly, it looked more like a teddy bear. You know, it wasn't this smaller head. It was a slightly teddy bear shaped head. And um, he had a slightly more, um, well, it wasn't as high pitched, certainly, as John Leeson's voice. But they were learning, you see, early. It always takes time for a television program to set up its parameters, as it were. And, you know, they learn quite quickly that perhaps um, if they can continue with this program, they better make it, you know, bungle a bit more sort of um, less scary looking. And they did. And, and, and I think David Cook enjoyed doing the program while he did it, but then he decided that it, he, you know, he'd had enough being presenter and they managed, they got hold of Jeffrey and Jeffrey took over, I think again in possibly the end of 1972. I'm not, again, I'm so bad on the years. But, um, and um, Stanley Bates joined him and then we had George, the pink hippo puppet, joined Zippy. And that was really brilliant as well. It was a lovely combination of people. So George wasn't initially one of the first characters along with... No, he wasn't. There were two characters called Mooney and Sunshine. Um, Mooney was a sort of purple, sweet little glove puppet, which Violet Philpott, who was the original puppeteer of Zippy, um, did the voice for. Right. And, but it, I think it was felt that Sunshine sounded too much, or his character was too much like um, Zippy. He was quite sort of naughty, and it was a bit confusing for the mm -hmm. children. So they dropped those puppets, and then they got a sort of a more... Um, um, well, uh, this pink hippo, which was a uh, lovely foil for Zippy, who was very show-offy and noisy and know-all-y. And George was a, a sort of yes character, really. He would just say, oh, yes, and uh, oh, yeah, Jeffrey, you know, and, and ask questions and, um, you know, much more simple, quieter character, and which made a really good contrast to the noisy Zippy. Yes, yes. I'm trying very hard to pull a straight face while you do Zippy and George it. Um, it's <laughs> incredible to hear you. I mentioned um, uh, uh, Jeffrey taking over his role, mm. and he remained with the show for many, many, many years. Oh, which, absolutely. Which didn't always, sadly, uh, work in his favour, because after um, Rainbow finished, it was quite hard no, that... for him to find more acting work. Yes, it was... It was... Sadly, it's one of those things that happens in television or when you become sort of, I, I mean, he became an iconic presenter, as it were, and people just knew his face. And um, so when he tried or his agent tried to get him work, you know, uh, other acting jobs, because he was a jobbing actor, basically, um, and uh, they used to say, oh, no, we can't use him. He's, everybody knows him as Jeffrey on Rainbow. And so, he, you know, he found it quite hard to get work mm. as um as a you know with other parts and yet it's such a shame because you know I, i've written a book since um of my early life and i mentioned in the book and i say that it was i felt really sad and i do still do the, the fact that he was never really used um mm. as a character actor which he really was brilliant i mean we we saw a little bit of that on the the latter shows of rainbow when we did Sort of, for instance, we did Zip Man and Bob in one of the programs, and he played the Joker, you know, based on the Batman and Robin mm. stories. And um, and he was brilliant with the makeup and the, the character. He's, he played lots of other lovely characters as well. And um, it's a shame, I think, people. Uh, I think more people in the profession, I'm sure the public wouldn't have mind seeing him in different no. guises and different things, but it was just, um, sadly, producers and um, agents and people said, no, 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 he's Jeffrey. We could, so, so 
in a way, he played it too long, mm. you know, uh, as Jeffrey. If he'd maybe left after, say, five years, he probably would be, you know, a well-known character actor. Mm. I think it's very interesting because, of course, as you said, he was known as Uncle Jeffrey from Rainbow. That's mm. what his longevity was. It's interesting hearing you um, say that having worked on the show, as somebody who watches the show and other people who watch it, I, I believe will sort of agree that, you know, of course, you know, it's very well that he um, had his longevity on the show. Um, maybe after five years, he could have gone on to do something else. But we yeah. wouldn't have had him on our screens and we wouldn't have enjoyed watching him you know, as viewers, you know, I certainly yes. wouldn't have had a chance to see him had he have left in the early 80s. So I, mm. as a viewer, I'm I'm very, very pleased that he did stay because he, mm. he became a treasure in people's homes. Everybody knew him. And oh, absolutely. And really fond of him, no matter what age you were, through generations. Oh, yeah. And people still remember him today very, very fondly. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I was really talking in a way for his own personal, yeah, you know, yeah. um, as an actor. I mean, the public absolutely adored Jeffrey, and he was an absolute pivotal um, personality on the show. If we didn't have Jeffrey, our father figure, it would be total riot in the Rainbow House. <laughs> and he was the, the grown up, he was the parental figure that um, kept us, you know, um, all together, and, and you needed. You know, you needed that character. I think you did, yes. Um, you were talking um, a little while back about the content in the episodes and how in some episodes Jeffrey really got to dress up and play these quite vivid characters, play mm. fairy stories and, and all sorts, which um, progressed as Rainbow sort of went down the years. In the very mm. early episodes of Rainbow, it was very simplistic, educational. It had the sort of national curriculum stance to it. Didn't Absolutely. It? Yes, I mean, that was... See, originally it was, you know, it was, um, we, we always had um, an educational advisor who was um, a teacher, an educationalist, you know, she was part of the, the team, in the production team, and she would scan the scripts and make sure that, you know, there was, the, the content was um, right for the age group that it was supposed to be going out for. Um, I think... Originally, it was very much like we're going to do a program about, um, oh, I don't know, um, ducks or something on the water. And so you'd have lots of film of ducks and different kinds of... And then we'd have a bowl, a plastic bowl in the studio with some water in it. And we'd have some yellow ducks, you know, and we'd have a game with ducks floating around. So the, the theme was kept all the way through. Um, but we, we it, there was the sort of reality of the real things we saw on film, and then you'd come to the studio, and there'd be a sort of game, but the, they'd still be ducks, they'd still be floating in the water, mm. and there'd be questions about, you know, um, what the food they should have, and mm. should we be doing... So it, it, it sort of worked in its own way. Um, I think as, the as time went on, we did do more sort of fantasy stories, but there was always... There was always the beginning, middle, and end. There was always a point to it. Um, uh, there were, as I say, the fun ones, like the, I'm, I'm saying Batman and Bobbin, and, or whatever it was called, and, or Zip Man and Bobbin, I beg your pardon. And so um, I think the, the audience, it was a sort of what the audience wanted. But, uh, I, 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 I kid you not to find somebody walking down the street that doesn't have a rainbow badge on or a sack <laughs> with zippy on it. Uh, it's incredible. Um, the merchandise um, that has come out as years have progressed. I mean, and there's even people now online that are making their own merchandise. You go onto these websites where people have created T-shirts with zippy on the front. Yes, it's incredible. that's true. Yeah, it's incredible. Um what I really found interesting is two points. Um, the first one, um, when we're going right back to the very early days of Rainbow, when mm. the shows were a little bit simplistic, and then as the audience grew, uh, it sort of started out initially as a preschool series for children mm. aged between two and five, and then by the end of its run, it was widened out to an audience of all ages, and you found that 
all people were watching Rainbow from parents to to their children, to brother and sister, to cousins, were just still fascinated by it, whether they'd seen it or not before. Yes, you're right. I think we got a, a really wide age range um, in the last few series of an audience. We, we got the, the parents who had watched it early on in the 70s um, were showing their children yep. the, um, the programs and therefore there had to be something in the program for the adults to enjoy as well as the, the, the children. I, I think it's, again, it's that thing of the characters were, after a time, we became, as performers, a sort of family. Mm -hmm. We knew each other, we knew the timings of how we they delivered lines and we knew what the characters would say almost before they said it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, we, it's a bit like um, the famous radio series, The Archers. There's people who have been on The Archers since 1950, whenever it was it started. And the writers have to be really careful. They know, the artists know their characters so well. And um, they, it's, it's, it's a bit like that with Rainbow. We, we knew each other very well. We, we, we got on very well. We, we were able to eventually, I didn't personally, but the cast were eventually able to write the scripts as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was one of the yeah. pro um, producers said, look, you know why I think, you know, it would be great to see whether, you know, if you'd like to, and at least four of the company, I think Jeffrey wrote some, Stanley Bates wrote mm -hmm. some, and Freddie Marks wrote some, and Roy Skelton wrote some. So right. four of the cast wrote scripts latterly towards the end of the, the, um, the Rainbow series for Thames. And that was, again, I think that helped the, the, um, the long life of Rainbow because they, everyone, you know, because the artists wrote it, they knew the characters inside, they were playing the characters. Right. Of course, we still had the educational advisor. She made sure that the, the themes weren't so um, avant-garde that people wouldn't understand. Sure. Um, we still had to keep in, you know, in mind that it was a preschool, but then, of course, we did know that their parents of um, of um, the younger ones would have watched Rainbow themselves, and possibly the grandparents would have watched it. So it was, it became a sort, of, as you say, a family show. It wasn't just, and and the the, the company, you know, um, were Thames were happy that it evolved that way because the audience numbers didn't go. You know, a lot of television in those days it was all about how many people who watched it and if the numbers started to dwindle then they'd probably say well we won't do another series because you know the numbers have gone down people aren't really interested but it never happened with rainbow yeah. i think that um you were mentioning about the fact that the cast knows their characters very well but after a, a certain time i should imagine you get to know your audience well as well so you sort of know what they want to see on screen oh definitely yeah yeah um I, so that's that's one sort of key point there you know you sort of know what the audience want and i guess as as the years went by you were getting well into the 80s into the early 90s mm. things progressed it technology allowed you to do more elaborate things absolutely so that also contributed to the way that the episodes... Definitely. Um, and s people seem to forget that um, Zippy, um, although he was one of the central characters, uh, both Zippy and George, we didn't really see much of Bungle and his family, but we saw a lot of Zippy and George and their family also played out on screen. We had Zippy... Absolutely, and yes. We, we, we had what we call a rehearsal Zippy, which became, um, in some programs, Zippo, who was um, Zippy's cousin. Um, so we'd have the two Zippy puppets, but one with a, a Zippo usually, I think, had a bow tie. Yeah. We get another puppeteer in just to work the puppet, because obviously we only had two puppeteers on the program. Yeah. And then we'd have um, Zippy's mum and dad. We'd have, um, oh, George's when he was a baby or something. I mean, yeah. they, that, we, luckily, we, they, you know, we were able to dress the older puppets up to become these different characters, yeah. which was great. Didn't Zippo start out, this is a very interesting fact that I didn't know, that in the very early episodes, Zippo was brought in as Zippy's cousin from France, so he was French. Ah. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and then later on down the line, 
he became this sort of American hipster character. Yes, that's quite interesting. You know, I'd totally forgotten that. Um, I assume, I don't know, yes, he's, um, uh, this was Roy's invention, Roy Skelton's invention, right. and um, so it was It was nice because he was, a, and I think probably he, he decided that it was probably better that he was a, a bit more... Um, you know, he changed his character over the year. He didn't appear, luckily, lots of times. So there was always a gap between when he appeared, you know. So so new people probably wouldn't have noticed the difference. But clever people like yourself, would, you know, who's probably watched it, one program after another, would be a bit more aware of the changes like that. Well, I but I think... Was, um, I just thought it was quite strange because all of a sudden Zippo came in as this character who was sort of quite polite and then in later episodes he would be rapping because that was one of the things that yeah. Zippo would do he came in and rapped quite a lot that's it and, um, that's it the, you're quite right we saw the sort of dynamic that um uh, because Zippy is this quite outlandish character that likes to have the limelight and I think mm, oh absolutely I think uh, there was always a bit of jealousy between the two of them I think you know I mean Zippy you know, he was, as I say, Zippo was family, like his cousin or whatever. But I think, you know, Zippy liked to have the upper hand on all occasions, but sadly that didn't always happen when Zippo was around. No, and I think that was the genius in changing the character. Because mm. it changed the dynamic of, um, of both of them, because then yeah. now you've got this character who is perhaps a little bit more cheeky, but than Zippy, and Zippy didn't really like that. Um, I remember in one of my favourite episodes of Rainbow was um, an episode that was broadcast quite later uh, down the line, and it was an episode mm. called Misbehaving, where all oh, of, yeah. all of that was probably a very fun episode to do, I could imagine. Oh yeah, definitely. Episode, Anything being yeah, naughty yeah, is always great yeah, fun to do. Yeah. Um, this, this, and this just goes to show how wonderful Jeffrey was as a character actor because he came in as this completely different character. Really good episode. Very clever. And you're absolutely right. It really showed Jeffrey's acting ability, didn't it? Yes. Because we were, I mean, as the characters, we were totally sort of shocked. Oh, but Jeffrey would let us do that. Oh, well, you know, you can't. Blah, blah, blah. And it was like, oh my goodness, who is this terrible person? Yes. And I think the the only way that they found out was that Jeffrey had sideburns or something on, oh, that's right. and they and I think he left one on or something. I I got this visual picture, that's right. and I think the audience and I think the audience suddenly thought ah because I think he didn't want. I think the idea was that we didn't even want the audience at home no. to know it was this. He was this uncle or this new babysitter or whatever, mm. and um, so. Yeah, no, it was fast. It was very good that program. Lots in that one. So yeah, um, as we sort of move on, Rainbow had um, uh, a lot of cross sections in it. In the very early episodes, there were lots of nursery songs that we played out in Rainbow. But um, the original, um, before Rod, Jane, and Freddie came along, what I found mm. quite fascinating is that. Rod, Jane, and Freddie—they were almost like a, a pop group for that era. Yes, no, definitely. And they never, ever underplayed. I mean, the music they played or um, they composed was never sort of childlike, sort of silly, you know, patronizingly, you know, plinky plonky stuff. It was always quite sophisticated. Yeah, and um, and the children absolutely loved it. Yeah. Basically, they were musicians. Mm. They were actor musicians, all three of them. And... Um, the, and what they did was they used to share. Freddie would write one song for one program. Rod would write a song for another program. And Jane would write a song because we did three programs a week. And so they shared writing the, um, the different the different um, songs. I mean, it was also, they were multi-talented musicians. Um, anyway, for the, the singers, that's what they did. They had, they wrote individual songs and as I say over a thousand songs they did win an award I think for musicianship you know I don't, I don't know whether it was equivalent of a BAFTA for their songs but it was a music award anyway which I thought was lovely Rainbow itself won won an award um, it, was, it was an equivalent of a BAFTA it was before the BAFTAs were invented really it was called the Harlequin Children's Award and um, Pamela Lonsdale, the original producer, went up. Uh, I think it was all in BAFTA, where they have BAFTA now, there, wherever it is. And um, Princess Anne gave this um, 
Harlequin Award to her, and we got sent a picture of the award and also a nice letter from the head of children saying, you know, thank you so much, you've been part of this award-winning show. And up until then, I think Blue Peter had won the Harlequin Award for many years, so we, we overtook Blue Peter, which was quite quite um, quite nice. <laughs> yeah, very nice so. achievement indeed. Um, so we mentioned uh, Rod, Jane and Freddie there, but they weren't the original line No. So take us through the uh, original lineup. Um, okay, well, the original lineup was called Telltale, oh. and um, I'm afraid I won't be able to remember the names of them right. because they had were gone by the time I I joined the comp. When I joined Rainbow, it was Carl, Julian, and um, Carl, Julian, and oh, I've forgotten his name again now. Carl, Julian, and Charlie. Sorry, Charlie, okay. Charlie, and she. They, they were the singers when I joined, but Telltale were the original singers, mm -hmm. and they were actor musicians again, mm -hmm. and they um, invented or or um, did the original theme tune. So the you know up above the streets and houses, yes. that song was their song, Telltale's song. So every time the, the theme tune was played, they got um, you know some money, but you know they get um, know you know, so, the so that was quite nice. Itself, it was already a song produced by them that they used. Yeah, they produced it for the, you know, the first the Rainbow series. They oh. they needed a theme tune, and they they were that was one of their first things was to produce the Rainbow mm. theme tune, which was fantastic because it's yeah. people it's so iconic, and people yeah, love it, don't they? they so. Do. And you mentioned uh, um, we'll sort of come back to the other lineup in a second, but oh, it's the other lineup was. Um, Charlie Dore and then um, Julian Littman and Carl Johnson right, yes. and they were the they took over from Telltale right. and they were like a folk group I mean they were they in a way those they didn't do so much fun enough acting they did rather nice lovely I mean they both they all had lovely voices and they mm -hmm. were able to play instruments of course as well and um, they did their own songs and they were lovely they were very nice mm. and then they just decided um that they wanted to go on and do something different and that's when they auditioned jane jane and rod and um the first thing that come with jane and rod was matthew corbett who was ah. um harry corbett's son and he won the the um audition in fact i think if i know the story is that um freddie actually auditioned um, for that, for that original lineup, but um, Matthew, they they he got the ch the part, so Freddie didn't get it. Oh, wow. And then um, after Matthew left to to sort of um, be the um, front man for the Sooty Show, he's taking after taking over his, from his father. Um, we got another actor singer, Roger Walker. And Roger took over again. Poor Freddie, I think, auditioned again and didn't get it. And Roger got it. And then Roger left because he was offered a um, a really good acting part, I think, for a BBC series. And he t he didn't, you know, he he left after one of the series that our series had finished. And um, they auditioned Freddie, and I think by that time. Um, Rod and um, Jane said, "Look, you know, you must have Freddie. He, he, you know, he knows the program. He knows us, mm -hmm. and that's how. That's when Freddie joined. And I think that was about 1980. Although he made such an impression, the three of them, that everyone thought it was Jane, Rod, and Freddie. They were they were the Rainbow Singers. And of course, I, you know, I, that I, was what people remember. It's yeah. funny. I, I, I somehow don't." think that Rod, Jane and Roger has the same feel to it. Really. Oh, no. Um, it no, you're sense. absolutely right. I think, it, you, you know, it absolutely clicked with Freddie. Freddie has a lovely sense. He's a lovely actor as well. Yeah. And he had a lovely sense of comedy, which was really good, you know, mm -hmm. for Jane and Freddie and, you know, um, sorry, Jane and Rod. And it, it just clicked. You could tell straight away once Freddie joined, that was, they were the team. What they were the one. The what do you put their success down to? Because they they had a very longevity even after Rainbow. Because I believe oh they yes, sort of left um, a little bit before Rainbow ended. They did indeed. Um, they were offered a series, their own series. You yeah. see, because everyone loved their songs, and they thought, well, the one 
way to continue getting the songs is that we do a program of all the songs and they use some of the rainbow songs um but they they did them more dramatically because of course it was didn't have to be do it within rainbow so yeah um as we move on a strange moment for you um must have been when you had a, a certain impressionist come into the rainbow studio oh yeah of course we're talking about uh, bobby davro uh, he that's came it in, uh, at one point and obviously uh, at that time i shouldn't imagine that children would perhaps know who he was but um, possibly not but the parents would you see and um i think and he did a most brilliant george voice and a brilliant zippy voice uh, a very funny story and roy really enjoyed being you know being sort of sent up as you know the sort of zippy voice and the george voice. i mean they, he you know he, he was very good we had um um various people that came in and did mm. stuff um who were funny and great fun yes, i'm yes, sorry i might the names are all going from my head now no, but, no, um, but um i've i've seen bobby davro in uh, pantomime on a couple of occasions yes. and he's just fantastic and my little cousin um we we go and see it um and we've been to woking for the oh uh, right we we live in uh, south london um and mm -hmm. we travel out to woking every year because we've made it a point now that if we want to see pantomime we'll go and see bobby because he is oh how nice incredible. and he will often cross-reference rainbow and that sort of thing and he'll do all the oh yeah stuff. he does the sort of frank spencer and um <laughs> that sort of stuff and i seem to remember a very poignant episode it's a, it's a sort of day where bungle just didn't want to do anything he woke up mm. and he was very very quiet and he was sort of mm. particularly he was just bouncing this ball on the floor and just sitting oh, there yeah. and tapping his foot and and i remember watching it was a it was a very poignant moment because um you know it showed a, a different side to this happy sort of bungle who and all throughout the episode um they played it out where you know, perhaps Bungle was just having one of those days. Children's emotions are sort of up and down all the time. And, and absolutely it's brilliant at playing that up because then as a child, you think, well, actually, I've had one of those days. And if Bungle can have one of those mm. days, I know that I'm OK. Yeah, I've absolutely. And in Bungle. Mm. Now, this was one of the I think, you know, this these sort of stories or this sort of these happenings that happened on Rainbow could only happen because of the longevity of the programme. Yes. Because we knew, you know, the characters very well. The writers certainly knew too now. They got they got an idea and and we were able to explore much more in depth all this sort of the emotional side of um, a ch ch child's life, as, as, and um, and it, they they were beautifully played by the characters because, as I say, we knew knew them very well. We know how they would react, and yet um, they would be still realised or still recognised by the audience that were watching. There was definitely a trust there, I think. As mm, well. definitely. And the audience trusted Rainbow, there, mm. which was particularly mm. good. Um, because there are children like that. that they're, oh, yes, it's, definitely. It's not necessarily, you know, the child being rebellious. It's that they, no. they can't, perhaps... It's part of their personality. They, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, and it's and I, I think, too, you're right. I mean, this, again, was one of the things, the decisions of the programme makers. They, they wanted to go through all these different sort of things that happen to children. I mean, I'm sure the education officer would sort of suggest ideas about this sort of thing. And then the script writers would sort of write a story around that theme. I think, in fact, this did happen a lot of the times is that the that was the job of the education officer. She would say, look, we haven't done, you know, she'd have a list of all the themes. That they, I mean, can you imagine over a thousand programs? I mean, they've certainly covered lots of stuff, but they might want to go back and say, look, let's let's re go revisit this mm. this emotion emotional side of a child this i think would be very interesting i mean i remember zippy had one where he lost his voice which was for the whole program he didn't speak and he, i it was quite i remember it because it was really hard to do it without having the voice to you know to talk so i was going mm -hmm, you know and he was tapping it and i had to do it all in mind with just one arm you know as if he's and he got mostly one arm and it was quite interesting and i mean it started off as they were saying oh zippy it's lovely isn't it quiet round here he's not shouting and 
you know, showing off. Right. Um, and Zippy was going, oh, and he couldn't, he couldn't speak. Yeah. And then eventually they changed the, that attitude of being a bit sort of cheeky to him. Yes. They, they felt sorry for him. And it was that lovely change, gradually thinking, well, actually, it is something really seriously wrong with Zippy. He can't speak. No, no. And, you know, that's another nice one where, the, you know, were things were reversed yeah. into the more positive um there were lots of episodes with zippy where we sort of felt very sorry for him i think one episode mm. was where he became tongue-tied because he was oh gosh yeah in love with this uh, glamorous television presenter <laughs> who was on the children's itv and and he oh yeah wanted to write her a love song and then oh that was very it, funny it was a good episode and all of a sudden he came face to face with her on i know she came into the studio into the rainbow house to read the story when, that was back when the days when you had to send in your letter to the yeah. company in order to get it read out that's and, right and, and yes, it was oh she was lovely that was a lovely program i remember doing that program oh, yes yeah. It was a lovely one to do. Yes. Because it was so sort of, again, it was so, it's what happens, you know, you fall in love with people and yeah. and he was, and it was very funny to have a television monitor with her doing her program oh, okay. and him just sort of gooey eyed looking at this lady that he just thought she was lovely. Yes. No, I thought that was lovely. I that. But he also had the chicken pots at one point as well. He oh, yes, yes, we had all spots put over his face yeah and, and, and again you know i think for the time you know because i think one of the things and i'm sure you'll agree that rainbow was very ahead of its time and mm. it was in the moment and the storylines were very up to date and they weren't shy in in portraying the dynamics of the characters i mean i've got this sort of little book in in front of me which is called rainbow exposed we won't sort of go into the ins and outs of it or why it was uh, produced but uh, it sort of talks a little bit about um, the dynamics of the characters and that, um that all all characters in rainbow were male characters that lived together were yeah unsure of the sort of relationships that they were all mm. they came across as a family who were very mm. willing to to sort of you know um stay together one of the funny things that i i found is that um that they would all share a bath together yet um would yeah. would look at the bath and think <laughs> well how on earth would bungle be able to fit in that bath <laughs> That's what, that's what I would wonder, although he would... Well, it was very difficult. We never had Bungle, luckily, in the bath at the same time, because yeah. it, it was bad enough getting two puppeteers in that bath, yes. hiding, you can imagine. Yes, no, it, it's, it's lovely when... And, and again, it, it, all, all these shows all sort of happened because um, uh, either the, the script writers were allowed to sort of really explore you know all that that side of the characters because they knew knew that and this could be and it would be fun to play and they trusted the actors to perform um it in the right way and they would they would know if you know how far to take it yeah. and so it wouldn't become rude or or um oh i don't know they wouldn't become too angry even if they were behind me they just knew exactly the right level to play it yeah. And um, and hence it made it made them also popular, really. Although there were occasions when uh, Jeffrey would perhaps lose his temper, and I remember. Oh yeah. Remember well, again, you know, it's like every any parental figure. There's be times when the kids go too far, and um, certainly there were many times. I mean, yeah. hence why. I mean, Zippy's name is, you know, Zippy, he's got a zip and he would be zipped up because he's just gone too far and Zippy and so Jeffy would say, right, Zippy, that's enough, yeah. and zip him up. There you go. We had a time where we had um, somebody wrote in and I think the producers or whatever decided, they wrote in and said, oh dear, when Zippy zipped up, he can't breathe. <laughs> and it was, they, I think they thought he breathed through his mouth or something. Well, he has got a nose, even though it's not there. Right. And <laughs> so um, they, the, the producer decided they wouldn't, you know, um, no. zip him up too it often. Nice. But the early days, we zipped him up quite a lot. Right. I mean, you know, but they did bring it, it did come back a little bit. They, I think we changed producers or something, I can't remember. And somebody said, look, you know, we haven't had Zippy zipped up for ages. Let's, let's do it. And that's what they did. And, you know, it was always, people used to sometimes watch it to see whether he would get zipped up because he was so naughty. And usually he had to be way over the top for them yeah. before they did um, zip him up. I find that 
find that extraordinary that somebody would take the time to call in and say, actually, we want Zippy unzipped. Mm. How extraordinary that that sort of made me laugh thinking about that. Um, just goes to show yeah. how real. We never left. I don't think we ever left the, the Zippy was never left zipped up. You know, at the end of a program, and then that would be the end. He was always unzipped, and he always said, "Oh, I'm very sorry. Oh, sorry, Jeffrey," <laughs> and all this sort of stuff. Um, so, and then of course he wouldn't be wouldn't be too long before he was being naughty again. But um, that was. That was the thing. He was never, because again, you know, they thought, well, you can't leave the story open-ended like that. It's got to have a finish, you know. Of course. Um, we're going to sort of go on to, um, because you, you of course, um, you know, with Rainbow, you've done lots of, you know, different work other than Rainbow. And it must be quite nice for you, I guess, for people to sort of know the voice and not necessarily the face as such, because... You know, they don't always, they wouldn't always recognize you if you were to walk down the street. No, definitely. And I, I love that. I mean, I always felt sorry for Jeffrey after a while that he couldn't go out to the shops to buy some food for his family or something without somebody saying, oh, I know who you are, you're Jeffrey. Mm. And it must be, it's all right at the beginning. It's you think, oh, it's quite a nice ego trip for you. Yes. But after a while, you just want to go into the shop and just buy some mm. food or whatever without being disturbed, you know, like a normal person. And he found he couldn't go out, you know, hardly at all to get stuff mm. because, you know, he was um, always recognized as all that Jeffrey from Rainbow. Right. Um, I mean, every now and again, I like, you know, appearing on television and or, a, you know, I get yeah. interviewed or something. That's fine, but that's, you know, once every... Oh, I don't know, a few months or even right. not even as long as that, you know, the right. gap. It, or, sorry, it's usually longer, the gap. But um, it's... That sort of it's, thing comes with sort of, you know, they sort of say, you know, that sort of thing comes with being in the business. But I can understand completely that it must be, a, in that respect, a lot easier, as you said, to sort of walk down the street. and. But, you know, it, it must be... Does Is it not strange for you that as soon as you know, um, you sort of open your mouth and Zippy comes out that people say, <laughs> wow, that is Zippy. Mm. And I think my, my Zippy is slightly, you know, it's very different from my own voice. I try to sound like, uh, you know, Roy as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But I, I sort of know his character because having worked the puppet for so long, do you know what I mean? The, yeah. It's almost ingrained in me. So um, it doesn't come too difficult. And the same when I've done George's voice, you know, it, it's, um, it's an, I find that an easier voice to actually do, to be honest. You hit it right, George. It's sort of, you know, it comes, it's much easier. But um, it, I, because I've always done voices for my own puppets and my own shows and stuff like that, I can, you know, it's, it, I, it, they don't normally, I don't normally do them without having the puppet on. Do, mm. do you know what I mean? And that's when it becomes alive. Yeah. And and so um, my you, natural voice isn't, I mean, there might be a bit of a zippy sounding in it after all, I don't know. But yeah. it doesn't, um, no, to me, I sound very different, thank well, goodness. Well, I think since my book came out, right, um, yes. people realize, mm. you know, and I'm quite honest about all the stories in it and all the rest of it, you know. So um, they have, you know, uh, uh, for instance, I just worked, I'm very lucky, I just worked on a film, which sadly I can't talk about because I've yeah, signed yeah. this NDA. Yes. But, um, and mean, the people on that were all in their 20s, 30s, 40s. And of course they brought up, they were brought up on Rainbow. And like yourself, you know, they really loved the program and the characters. And they said, you didn't, you weren't, were you really zip, you know, and all this sort of yeah. stuff. So, um, it, 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 that is very nice. And then when it, you sort of do the voice, they kind of go... Oh, my people. goodness, yes. That always That's that always makes them... To sort of they do laugh and they love fashion. it. What an achievement as, you know, if somebody sort of says to you, you know, or if you say to them, well, actually, I was Zippy and I sort of loved <laughs> you, George, in Rainbow. And then yeah. you know, it's sort of, to them, it's like a pinch me moment because that is their mm. in a nutshell. Mm. That must be, you must be very proud of that. Really, it is lovely, and I love it. And yes. 
I'm, I mean, I, I, you know, I do have to pinch myself sometimes when I think, you know, it was originally, you know, I did it. I didn't know it was going to be the, the, it was going to be such a, um, well, I didn't know there was going to be such a loyal fan base, which there is even now. Here is, uh, if we can see here on the screen, there is your book, Zippy and Me, um, that uh, is newly uh, published. Selling very well. It was uh, actually on Amazon because um, and eBay and all those sort of yeah. sites. But um, hopefully, after COVID, we'll have more um, more books in bookshelf bookshelves oh, okay. bookshops and. Nice. Um, so um, hopefully pe more people will buy it. I mean, I have sold quite a few. I, well, I've sold all my copies that I had, you know, given to me as a as the author. And they all went or gave some of them away, of course. So they've gone now. So, um, yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's been lovely, Korean. And I'm, as I say, I'm still, thank goodness, quite fit and able to carry on doing stuff. So I'm doing, you know, as I say, at the moment, I've been doing lots of podcasts and publicity yeah. talking about my life with puppets because it's, it's been quite a long life yeah. we are going to sort of round up very soon um but uh, i want to sort of come on uh while we can and sort of move mm -hmm. swiftly on uh because you've worked on lots and lots of other programs it wouldn't be fair if we didn't touch upon them of course you worked on the muppet christmas carol which was wonderful that's right yeah that was a beautiful uh um movie that you sort of worked on who did mm. you operate on that it was one of the sort of minor characters wasn't it i was yes basically we we, we I, on all the muppet films i've worked on so far i've been what's known as an additional puppeteer which means that if they have crowd scenes they have their core puppeteers um and then they have additional puppeteers to come in and do the crowd scenes so i would on muppet christmas carol i'd be some of the characters looking out the windows when um scrooge and kermit and were walking along the um the snow um laden road or whatever or and then there was a party at the end when scrooge turned over a new leaf and bought them a t the Cratchit oh, wow. family a turkey. And we had, um, there were lots of puppets, lots of characters cool. at the um, dinner table. And I was, you know, two of those characters and things like that. So, yeah, there, you know, with lots of stuff like that. Yeah. And the yeah. same thing with Muppet Treasure Island as well. I was oh, extra yes. characters on that. Um, working closely with uh, Jim Henson, of course. But, uh, yes. But, um, yeah, and also we have to mention that uh, you've operated a, a little sausage brain sweep <laughs> on the Sooty Show, and that must have been particularly lovely for you because where you were quite housebound in the sort of Rainbow Studio, you were able you're to absolutely right, yeah, to do all these amazing things like climbing rocks and, uh, <laughs> and doing all these uh, amazing seaside adventures. That's uh, it. Yes, we we did. Story. It was the location work that really sort of got me interested although I'd known Matthew because of his early days on Rainbow right. and also I was brought up with his father doing Sooty and Sweep on yeah. television so it was um, just as exciting for me to meet the Harry Corbett and the real Sooty and the real Sweep and the real yeah. Sue and all the rest of it and it was oh it was it's been lovely and I've since moved on from working with doing all those lovely shows with them to working with Richard Cadell, who is the owner of Sooty now. And I did the last television series he did with Sooty and I played Sue this time. I didn't voice Sue because lovely Brenda Longman voices Sue, but I played Sue and that was lovely to do. Yes. That was a couple of years ago now, I think. Yes. And uh, I know Richard is desperate to get a film version of Sooty one day and hopefully that'll come come to any I know he'd like me to be involved in that so you never know that might happen when they can get all the yeah. finance and all the rest I, of it I think there's a room for a, a sussy show I think they're a, a big movie I think it's amazing um we we share our love for Matthew Corbett of course I, I adore him oh, yeah. as a as a person on television because he he had this very um clever way of not talking down to children and speaking Absolutely. at a level that you know as if they were adults and a lot mm, of the yeah never patronizing at all he he was he, he was one of them you know they were all a gang together and and that's how it worked and the dynamic between the setup with matthew and sooty compared mm. to of course uh 
um, uh, Rainbow and Jeffrey was very different because Matthew was sort of the the big kid that could fall for all of. Well, he was like the older brother, yes. and he was the he was the one. He was a big kid, really, and Sooty and Sweet knew that, mm. and they could run. F um, you know, I was going to say fingers round him, but you know what I mean, and and told him to do things for them, and he would, and of course, then he'd fall into the mud or he'd fall over. I mean, he loved all that slapstick, yes, yes. and of course, it was great for the puppets because, you know, they, that was a, a, a wonderful thing for them to react to. Puppets are great reactors, mm -hmm. and they, if you've got somebody like Matthew who was always falling and fooling about, they, all they had to do, the puppets just sort of laughed. They set the gag up, or the puppets have, and then Matthew just falls into it every time, and that was the fun the fun thing. What a beautiful program the Sooty Show was, and again, gone down through generations and still as, as strong today, or it's time mm. to remember. But you're still very active in the world of uh, puppetry and children's TV. You know, more recently, you've been working for uh, the Children's BBC, which is, of course, now known yes. as CBBC, working with uh, Hacker T. Dot. Oh, indeed, yes, lovely Phil. Phil Fletcher. In fact, tomorrow I shall be interviewing them. Um, I think I told you earlier on that I was um, a member of the British Puppet and Model Theatre Guild. Well, we've, I've, as the years have gone on, they've invited me to be the president of the guild. So I'm now the president, and I've got the honour to interview them tomorrow for um, the the Guild AGM, which is happening online on Saturday. But I'm interviewing Phil and also Warwick Brownlow Pike, who is um, the puppeteer for, well, there's Hacker and Dodge, the two different dogs. And um, I worked with Phil on the Sooty Show, actually. He, he played Sweep and I played Sue, but I've met both of them, oh, probably about 12 years ago originally. And um, they were very fairly new to television then, but they just took to television puppetry and that sort of character-driven stuff. And um, they're absolutely brilliant. I mean, Phil, for instance, is a brilliant puppet maker. He makes wonderful replicas of the Muppet characters, but also individual um, characters himself, you know, his own characters. It has been fascinating uh, talking to you, reminiscing. I'm going to round up uh, very shortly, but I, I ask all my guests um, this very question. We would like to offer our guests the chance to play a television theme tune from their childhood. You know, what, what inspired you? I know you touched upon it a little bit with Watch With Mother, but if you had to choose a programme that was your favourite programme growing up, uh, what would it be? Oh, right, OK. Well, I was brought up in the era of Watch With Mother, and I loved um, Bill and Ben, the Flowerpot Men. I used to love those puppets. In fact, I mean, again, I was very, very lucky in the late 70s, or I can't remember the dates, but I actually worked the, one of the original Bill and Ben puppets for a commercial for the Ideal Home Exhibition, which was lovely, and, you know, that was amazing. But that was one of the first things I watched. Bill and Ben, the flower. Men. Do you ever um, think we before we go that would ever get to see Rainbow on our screens again as it was before? I don't know. Um, it's a difficult question. I, I mean, I know people have always, you know, initially when it stopped, yes. and maybe after the first two years after it hadn't been on, people did write up and try and do it. But then you see television has changed. There, there isn't these big companies like no. um, Thames anymore. There are much smaller independent companies, and um, they're much more interested, even more so, in the ratings, you know, of, and there, there isn't really the preschool programs anymore. They, they seem to have sort of died out on television. I think partly that, that they were, these were all in the days of terrestrial mm. television, and now they've got all this streaming, and uh, mm. you've got children's channels, you've got all these, and there's, what, 10 or 12 different channels they can all watch yeah hopefully we will see an appearance from rainbow in the future ronnie lee yeah. drew it's been amazing to talk to you um if i can have the honor of being jeffrey now and saying goodbye and will you join me with bungle george and of zippy course. Of course. thank you very much well in the true words of jeffrey that's all we've got time for on today's program but you take care won't you bye-bye bye-bye everybody goodbye bye goodbye bye-bye Thank you, Ronnie. God bless. That's okay. Thank you. Bye. Bill and Ben, Bill and